my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Robert Tilling, Bob Tilling. And I would be amiss if I didn't just point out that his lovely wife, Susan, is here in the back of the room as well. Yeah. So thank you, Susan, for bringing Bob along to us. <laughs> and their daughter. Karen is back here, too. Uh, Bob is scientist emeritus, volcanologist emeritus with the United States Geological Survey at the USGS Vol uh, Volcano Science Center. In 2004, he retired, which, as many of us know, that just means you don't get paid anymore. <laughs> After 42 years as a volcanologist at the USGS, uh, he certainly continues his volcano studies as well as occasional consulting work on volcanic hazards. He's the author of eight books about volcanoes and earth processes, as well as uh, many, many technical papers. He has advised foreign governments, studied volcanoes around the globe, managed various scientific teams and organizations within the USGS. And during the reawakening and the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, he was in charge of USGS studies. In recent decades, he has also been actively involved in educational outreach and co-authored USGS's all-time best-selling map, This Dynamic Planet, a world map of our plate tectonics that's specifically intended for teaching purposes. Really neat uh, product. Crucially, he is a member of the geologists of Jackson Hall, a regular visit, uh, visitor to our valley, um, where he and, and Susan visit uh, Karen and family, uh, which we're very pleased to have happen. I'm sure they are too. Um, and without further ado, then I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Robert Tilley. Bob. Thank you, John, for that very gracious introduction, as you always do. And uh, uh, Susan and I always love to come here. We're very good reasons, and I see a lot of faces I know out there in the audience here, and I've met a lot of you, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to do today is basically show you a movie, and I'll talk a little bit before and after it, but in my mind, the movie that you'll be seeing very shortly here is a classic, one of the few movies ever made by the U.S. Geological Survey, and I think when you see it, Keeping in mind it was made more than a half century ago, so the technology may not be all that great. But the footage you'll see is probably some of the most amazing footage of the Hawaiian Balkans in the sea. So I think what I'd like to do is actually start with uh, a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about the, the uh, introduce the movie, because some of you in the audience maybe haven't been out to Hawaii yet, so I'll I'll talk a few minutes about that. But then basically I'll show the movie, and the movie will be shown in a high resolution version that John's going to set up for me. And then after the movie, I'm going to comment a little bit, why was this particular eruption so important and so special? Okay, just a very quick, quick few slides on where Hawaii is. It's the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The end of a big, what I call a volcanic hotspot trail. There and here. If we zoom in on it, the island of Hawaii is the youngest of the Hawaiian islands and the currently the one with the active volcanoes. It is made up of five volcanoes, and all of the eruptions have taken place at these volcanoes, either within their summit craters or along the rift zone. So these pink swaths here and here. And if we zoom in a little bit closer still, at the moment, Kilauea is, eru is erupting simultaneously, both at the summit crater and also on the rift zone at Pu'u O'o. And this is kind of rare, but it does happen every now and then. But this has been going on now for, for a long time now, so it's unusual historically. And then the movie itself will be centered on the 1959-1960 eruption of Kilauea at Kilauea Iki and Kapoho, which is the far end of the east rift zone of Kilauea. 
just to show you where these two are. And again, for those of you who've been out to Hawaii, you probably have seen this view before. This is another view of Kilauea Iki Crater. There's the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Here's the entire Kilauea Caldera at the summit. And the current lava lake is active here right now. And some of you on the field trips saw a little bit of that poking up high enough when the lava level was high enough. So now we're going to go, John, if we can, directly to the movie. I brought two versions of it. One, a, a high-resolution uh, version, which is two gigabytes. And the one that I had on my PowerPoint with a low red. But John thinks he can get us onto the higher-resolution one. If not, we'll fall back to the, the lower-resolution version. And the movie's going to last about 27 minutes. Keeping in mind, this was made in 1962. So it's old footage, but it's one of my favorite volcano movies. <laughs> and then we can talk about it later. Yep, go ahead, John. Thank you. Thank you. 
as the summit eruption started from a half mile long line of fissures, halfway up the south wall of the 650 foot deep crater Kilauea Iki. Within an hour after the outbreak, cameras were set up about a mile away to obtain these photographs of lava fountains spurting to heights of 50 feet. They feed a number of braided lava streams that pour down more than 300 feet to the bottom of the crater, where they coalesce and begin to spread across the floor. The flat 37-acre floor of the crater, formed by lava extruded in 1868, is rapidly covered by the new lava. Sparkles of light dancing over the lava are burning trees carried along by the flows. As they move across the floor, they break through their own cooler margins, forming lobes. During the next two hours, the fountains increase to 100 feet high along the entire half-mile line of fissures in the crater wall. These lavas contain less than 50% silica and cool to form what are called tholeite basalts. The hottest lava is bright yellow-orange. As its surface cools, it becomes dark red, although it's still very hot inside. By 10.30 p.m., fountaining declines at the outermost vents, but they continue to glow, and many emit gases that burn with pale yellow-blue flames. Large bubbles of rising gas in the vents cause vigorous splashing of the lava over the edges. Before sunrise, the main fountain is 100 feet high and looms above trees that have been stripped by heavy masses of lava spatter falling through them.
the bombing continued through the night, sometimes suddenly showering new portions of the crater slopes. Through the first six days of activity, the fountain has continued to grow to more than ten times the height of Niagara Falls. It forms very strong air currents and more and more pumice and cinder which the prevailing trade winds blow to the lee of the vent, building up a large pumice and cinder cone on the crater rim. By the end of the eruption, the top of this cone will be 400 feet above the level of the vent.
the vomiting action is caused by the effervescence of dissolved gases in the lava, released when it approaches the surface. This fountain is spurting from one to two million cubic yards of lava per hour. Changes in the vent shape and in the violent release of gas cause variations from the almost explosive spraying of lava seen here to jet light fountaining as high as 1,900 feet during later phases of the eruption. The highest fountaining ever recorded in Hawaii. The solid crust of the lava lake continually breaks and huge rafts plunge beneath the molten lake. This continuous foundering and reforming of the crust occurs during both the filling and the draining of the lake. At night, the phenomenon shows well the rapid cooling of the exposed lava surface. At the edges of the lake, trees and forest litter were often buried by lava. For some time, individual tree trunks give off superheated organic gases that burst into bright yellow flames as they explode from the surface of the lake.
7.30 in the evening, the flight direction started. Through the center of the six-sided block of ground, a series of lava fountains form a spectacular curtain of fire 3,500 feet long. Lava fountains up to 100 feet high play along the entire rift for almost four hours in an area about 60 feet above sea level and only two miles from the ocean.
Act, following Simpson and Thomas have completely stripped the leaves from the papaya trees. The schoolhouse and other buildings in the village of Caporro are slowly consumed by lava.
saw the, the fountains dying down in Kokoho, and they mentioned the deflation at the summit. And here's a little part that's not touched upon in the movie at all. Back at the summit, at Hale Mau Mau, because of the subsidence and the deflation, new cracks opened up, and some old lava from 1952 got re-extruded through these cracks so here's 1952 lava being re-erupted in 1960, briefly. And there's a picture of that. Here's 1952 lava coming through cracks that formed later on in 1960. Now this is kind of contrary to most geological thinking of the, you know, the younger layers are on top of the AC, but this is a total kind of a anomaly, which is rarely seen, but it happened. Okay, uh, now I would now like to sort of just spend a few minutes talking about what made this so special. Well, first of all, it was spectacular. I, I would hope you would agree. Yeah. But not long eruptions. The, both eruptions lasted about a month or so. So in comparison to the current activity at Kilauea, which began in January 1983, and it's still going on. So these were short, live eruptions, but spectacular. And I won't even comment on the lava fountains. I would like to comment briefly that the formation of the lava lake inside Kauai became a natural laboratory for studying how, how lava cools and crystallizes. And science actually has drilling studies to, through the crust, the solid crust is still to, to study the bulk material below. And I'll show a little bit of that. But what really made it important was that in the 1950s, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory really became kind of a world-class model of modern volcano monitoring. Uh, I think, although it was created in 1912, a lot of the techniques were known, but by the 1950s, the early 1950s, a lot of the systems then had become much more systematic and regular, so we could make better and more constant measurements. And basically, this particular eruption, the 1959-1960 eruption, was kind of the beginning of how the scientists began to understand how Kilauea works. Okay, uh, this was, at least to my knowledge, the formation of Kilauea D. Lava Lake was the first time that anybody, anywhere in the world, attempted to drill into a lava lake. And this was actually started by the USGS, by the People's Observatory, as early as April 1960. After the crust had formed, the temperatures on the surface of the crust were fine, it was atmospheric. And here you can actually see the, here they are using very primitive equipment. The highest level of the lava lake at the time in 1959. But they finally penetrated it in July 25th, 1960, they actually drilled through the solid crust and were able to sample and measure the temperature of the molten material still below. I was involved with some of that in 1975. The equipment was still pretty primitive, but it was a little better. Oh, I should mention that the first drilling was done with a half-inch hand electrical drill, a half of a bit of one and one-eighth inch carbide tip. So I guess only the electric drill that drills in the solid solid. And here we uh, had a little differently. We had a little jeep set up as a winch system to haul stuff up and down to the drill site. We didn't have to use a helicopter to bring some heavy duty equipment in. But and here shows some of our people actually on the drill rig hauling out some drill rods and whatever. And on the right here, you see a picture of the drill hole. It shows the size of it and the, and the camera tripod leg. And the camera's looking down this hole through tens of feet of solid rock, looking at the still molten, glowing lava from 1959. Well, that was kind of exciting for me to be involved with that. And here's a picture of me in my younger days when my hair was darker. <laughs> I was lowering a thermocouple line down the drill hole to get a temperature profile in, in, in one of the drill holes. And 
I would like to point out the... Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, this is standard US <laughs> But actually not. Susan, in the back of the room there, very lovingly, put these patches on my pants, right? Torn them falling through rough ball and stuff. So, so she actually used the fabric from the Moo's fabric that she made for our daughter, leftover pieces in her to fix my field. <laughs> And here, just a quick example of some microscopic views of the sample that you can actually collect down these drill holes. It's sampled the molten rock, measure the temperature at which the sample is collected. So you can actually do a controlled study on how, how you get more and more crystals with decreasing temperatures. I mean, this, you know, obvious, and you can do it in a laboratory experiment. Here's a natural laboratory for doing that. So lots of studies have been made and lots of good things have been learned about how the salting magma solidifies and crystallizes. Now, the other thing I mentioned very briefly was that this was kind of the time when the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory entered what I call the modern era of Volcano Water. And just for those of you out there who probably I uh, haven't heard this before. There are two basic sets of data we need to, to obtain a volcano to try to predict when they might, might erupt. Virtually all volcanoes swell up before they erupt. They pop up like a balloon. And two of the techniques that are the most diagnostic are using the seismic data and also the actual blowing up of the of the volcano, the inflation. So by tracking the earthquakes, the seismicity around the shallow magma reservoir, and also measuring the tilt, as well as other measurements of how the land is changing, we can get an idea whether something's building up or not, whether it might erupt or not. And just to give you an idea how how precise this measurement of the change in the slope of the volcano, what we call tilt, is it measured in micro radians. And what this really translates into is that a change of one millimeter over a baseline of one kilometer, we can see that. It's measurable in the instruments that are used. And a lot of these techniques were developed at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory in the early 20th century. But by the 1950s, they had become more systematic and the same with the seismic data before the 1959 eruption. We had in the mid-1950s the development of a telemeter seismic network. That, that, that was kind of the first around the world. And so we could actually track almost in real time the earthquake activity where and, and how big and so on. Oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. Okay, now, I mentioned tilt. The, here, up until the 1959 eruption, there was a gradual buildup that the volcano was slowly puffing up. But at about this time, because they started getting a network of tilt meters rather than single individual measurements, the scientists could actually say something is really going to happen soon. And you'll see that the typical pattern is the volcano inflates, then during an eruption it deflates. In other words, once the pressure is released by the eruption of the magma itself. And just to show you this, this pattern, what we call inflation deflation works, here I show a slide that, okay, here's the Kilauea Kapoho eruption, it's the largest deflation of any in historical time, although it was a very brief eruption. And then if you look at a little tiny piece of this part of the continuous activity, you see the same pattern, but on a scale much, 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 much slower. So as the technology has gotten better, we can track smaller and smaller changes and actually get more uh, data. And that just shows it even better. It just shows here's the the big eruption that you just saw in the movie, and then it up and down since that time. 
Now, from these kinds of data, from the earthquake data, from the ground deformation data, the tilt data, that we actually can actually get an idea of how the whole system behaves from the, 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 the subsurface part, the magma reservoir, as it pressurizes and builds up, and then when it erupts, it deflates or depressurizes. The scientists at the time, who's from the 1959-1960 eruption, came up with this basic model of how Kilauea works. They, they, from their model, from the earthquake data and other data, magma formed at about this level, at about 60 kilometers below the surface. Then it comes on up, and then it's stored in a temporary reservoir beneath the volcano. And this basic model, actually, which was inspired by the 1959-1960 eruption, is still basically whole. There are wrinkles in it, there are minor details in it, but that's how Kilauea works, pretty much. Bob, the uh, numbers on the upper right, are those velocities and densities of the material? Up here? Yes. Yeah, okay, then here's seismic velocities, 4.3, 6.6, 7.9 densities. Yeah. And here's just a cross section uh, done by one of the seismologists at HBO. It shows the earthquakes, a cross section beneath Kilauea. And you can see how the earthquake data figures very prominently how the scientists have re, uh, have interpreted or constructed a simple model of how Kilauea works. There's the summit, it swells up, you can have summit eruptions, then as Luby pointed out, you can have migration of magma down drift. So there's a connection between the summit reservoir and the rift zones. Here it is here, the summit eruption, and Kapoho would be out here. So it was from this particular eruption that we really got the dynamic model sort of nailed down, and we're improving upon it all the time. And that's the end of my story. I would, I would love to entertain questions. Uh, just for your information, that's the, the big cone that was shown in the movie there. This is what Kilauea Key Crater is now, as some of you probably saw on your field trip. So thank you, Al. Thank you for the question. showing that it went up about 700 feet. It may be an artifact of the film or <coughs> something, but some of it was looked like it was quite hot, different than the rest of it. Was that a temperature variation, or was it just a fall of film? My guess would be it probably something to do with the film. You've know, you got to keep in mind, this movie was 1962, and I don't know when the first color films were movies Well, the rest made. of it was orange and pink, the proper color, but it's the highest yeah. part was but in general, white. in general, uh, the yellower the color, hotter the temperature the magma. So when you get to kind of the white hot 
white yellowish color, that's the hottest temperature. Yes? On, on that age question, what would the age be of the islands further to the northwest? The first okay, the they get older and older. Yeah, how far uh, back do we uh, I didn't want to get into that whole story that the, how, how the whole island chain formed, but as you go to the northwest, the older islands, when you get to the island of Kauai, the oldest rocks there are on the order of, I think, 2.8 million years old, whereas the oldest rocks on the big island is about 0 0.6 million years old. So, and you know, that's part of the hot spot theory. Yeah, yeah, right. And actually, when you follow that that that, uh, that big long hot spot trail all the way up to the Aleutians, the the seamounts there are on the order of 72 million years old. So that whole chain has taken that long to get to where we are. Yes. Um, I'm surprised that trees weren't bursting in flames, and uh, I'm wondering how close were people. And what's the gradient of the air cooling as you move away from that lava? Now that's a great question. The the uh, the trees do burst in the flame like that. In fact, in 1973, I saw a similar eruption in Pahagi Crater where it came into a forested floor, and the little white bursts are the trees exploding, and and that's because the trees are saturated with moisture and wet, and when the hot lava hits it, it just bust and, and then it comes bust almost immediately. But in terms of the temperature gradient, one of the rules of working around an active vent, you stay up wind. <laughs> so downwind you can be in trouble, you can get burned, you can get your hair singed, you can get, get scalded and so forth. But if you stay upwind, the photographer was upwind on all of these that I pursued. Uh, that's one of the first things you learn. So that it, it really drops off very, very quickly if you're off wind. Sure, you can feel the heat, but it's not dangerous. Yes? In the film, they referred twice to the depth or thickness of the lava lake. This was done by comparison for what the level was before to what they could see now, not by drilling. Yes, that's absolutely right. The question was the depth of the lava lake, because we knew what the topographic shape of the crater was before the eruption started. And the highest stand of the lava lake compared to you know what it was before the eruption. Actually the, the, the actual measurement is about four hundred and thirty four feet, the deepest part of the lake. And you know the last drilling of the lake, there been nine drilling studies starting first of all in nineteen sixty, just a a few months after the eruption of South Uh there were nine drillings, and the most recent one was 1988. And at that point, they were still encountering little bits of, by that time, the crust, of course, was already 170 feet or whatever thick. They were still at some molten body. And calculations show, if you take the rate of cooling, that probably became totally solid in the mid 1990s, sometimes depending on how, what, what assumptions you use, and it's still hot down there. But you know, uh, lava is a great insulator. In fact, we used to walk on a fresh lava flow just after it comes out, and you get a few inches of solid crust, and that's enough to insulate you from the, the hot temperature. <laughs> after the, the lake formed. How far did you uh, have to drill before you got into the molten material? Okay, the the first, uh, I should bring that slide back, but when they first penetrated the, the, the thickening crust was in July 1960 and that was at 19 feet. So they drilled through 19 feet of solidified surface. Then the drill string they were using just fell in under its own weight in the molten stuff and they had to pull it out so it wouldn't get stuck. Yes? Well, what are your, your first slides that you had in your mouth? There was a little tiny volcano that was in the ocean. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. I, I need to go way back. Hang on a minute. It was during your own slide. Okay. Hang on a minute. We'll get there. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I think
think you're talking about this. Yeah. This is. Part of Pardon? Was it part of, of Talawaya? That is, is it a hot spot? With no, it, 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 yeah, it's all part of the hot spot. I mean, the hot spot, how large it is, people really don't know. It's got to be something on the order of 200 miles or 300 miles wide diameter. And this is Lo'ihi. It's a submarine volcano that we know is active because we get earthquake activity at it. They send down uh, submarine submersibles to study it. And they actually have captured uh, a major eruption there at this particular place in 1995. So it's an active volcano, but it's still 3,000 feet below the sea surface. So someday, Someday, this will, if it keeps going, emerge above sea level. And whether it stays an island or not, or gets joined to the big island, we don't know. Yes? Well, my question is related to that. Did, can they theorize whether the lava is coming up kind of as a steady stream, or whether it's coming up like in, in pulses? Like, OK. So one pulse would be this island. Other big pulse would be a new island. Uh, okay, but this gets complicated here because the current Hawaiian hotspot, maybe I should go back. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, here we go. So the, the, the hotspot is here, located here. And there's no unanimous opinion about how big the hot spot is. It's a thermal anomaly, but it's got to be at least big enough in diameter to feed Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and Oe. So you draw a big circle around that, and maybe that's what the hot spot is. But to answer your question, the magma is being generated all the time at about the depth of 60 kilometers or so. And these are little, little blobs and flips because they're less dense than the surrounding solid rock, they start coming out. Probably a little blob, and they coalesce. They'll make a little bigger blob. And then they finally come up and get stored in the shallow magma reservoir, which is about one or two kilometers below the present surface. And that just is a, uh, what we call a plexus of dikes of molten material, rather than just a single homogeneous mass. So when magma comes into the system and puts pressure on all the molten stuff and the molten material has to find room. So it pushes up, pushes up, and then forces the volcano to swell up. And until it reaches some particular pressure, it's enough to crack a crack and then it comes through. Then the pressure is released and then the magma then the surface then collapses again or deflates. Is this Hawaiian ridge active like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and separating? Okay, that's a great question. No, this Hawaiian, this, this particular ridge is not like the Atlantic Ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is where the two plates are coming apart. And so there's volcanism there along, along the deep at sea. And the country of Iceland is the only part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge system that's exposed on land. And studies have been done, uh, mostly calculations, that 75% of the Earth's volcanism occurs submarine along these spreading ridges, like the Atlantic Ridge. But this is a, a hot spot trail. It's a hot spot here. You get melting of the solid rocks here. You get, uh, you get the formation of volcanoes and eruptions. That as the plate moves on, that part of the plate get, gets cut off from the feeding thermal source. And so the, the volcano then became extinct, and they get older and older to go. This particular bend in this thing is about 42 million years old. The seamounts there last were active probably 42 million years ago. And when you get up to the Aleutians here, they're about 70 something. So it's a moving plate, you generate magma, you 
have eruption, a deep sea first, and that goes on for <coughs> millions of years, and finally that, that volcanic structure rises above sea level to form an island, as we have now in Hawaii. Peter? Yeah, you might say it's much like the Snake River Pine. Yeah. Yes, like yeah. Of absolutely. Of yes. Yeah, the same idea now, that probably a lot of you in the audience know here, uh, that, that the, the hot spot theory is not unanim unanimously accepted by everybody. And we couldn't get Julian here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some real true believers. Um, then there are people who don't believe it at all. Then it's a question of, okay, it's a hot spot, but is it deep? Does it go down to the Coromandel boundary? Or it just go down a few hundred kilometers? And these are questions that are still being argued. And the problem is, the deeper you go, the less we know. So you're more and more dependent on models, computer models, and calculations on what it might be. I mean, what kind of data would you need to, to, to test the various models? What's the problem? What caused the angle? Pardon? What caused the angle? Oh, okay. That's also not well known, but one common theory is that's when the, the India plate hit the Eurasian plate and it, it changed the fundamental worldwide reorganization of the tectonic plates. But, but it, it's hard to test. And it also used to be that the prevailing theory that the hot spots were fixed. They never moved. Only the plates moved. And that's why people then said, okay, there was a change. You know, the hot spot had only been, been here, but there was a change in the movement. So if the hot spot was actually, or the plate was going in this direction, north south up until about 42 million years ago. And then since that time, been going northwest. But now there's some recent uh, data using paleomagnetic data on latitudes that show that the hot spots can move, including the Hawaiian one. So that, uh, that the hot spot moved for a while, and then it got fixed here since that time. But actually migrated down like this, then it got into this direction. And these are fun things that people are worried about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just searched the book recently about uh, Mount St. Helen eruption, and the author discussed a criticism of the forecasting of when that would um, erupt, um, saying that the volcanologists had a lot of experience with the Hawaiian volcano, but this was a different type of volcano. Do you think that's a fair criticism? Or? No, well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to back up a bit because it, it John mentioned that uh, Mount St. Helens came back to life on my watch at the USGS when I was in charge of the Volcano Hazard Program. And, you know, the last major eruption on the lower 48 was last peak in 1915. So this was a whole new thing for us. And so but it was up to me to send people out to Mount St. Helens to study and so forth. And the, the people who are the experienced volcanologists all received their training and experience in Hawaii. So, I mean, realizing full well Mount St. Helens is a different kind of volcano. But our, our, our challenge was what techniques that are useful in Hawaii could be useful in Mount St. Helens. And actually we found a lot of it could be used for earthquakes, tilt data, and so on. But Mount St. Helens is a different kind of volcano. So I don't know who this author is criticizing. I mean, that's all we had. You know, that was the only game in town. And the other story I'll, I'll, I'll tell you folks here, maybe some of you have heard it from me before, is that being that I was the guy in charge of the program, I had a budget which was largely devoted to Hawaii with one million dollar volcano hazards program. It basically funded the Hawaiian Volcanoes of the Charter. So I go to my boss at the USGS and say, hey, is there some kind of a contingency pot of money that we get to deal with these things that just come up that are not a part of our budget? He says, no, Bob, sorry, you have to do the best you can. <laughs> okay. And I go to the director of the USGS at the time, 
I ask him the same question. Is there some emergency fund that I can use to send people there to study housing dollars when it was building up to the bigger option? He says, no, Bob, sorry, you have to do the best you can. Well, I had to do something. <laughs> so I told the people that I was sending them out to St. Helens to use this particular account number that I had for my account. And it's called the Office Coordination Account. Which covered my uh, uh, paper, scotch tape. <laughs> well, obviously, it was, but it was a legitimate federal USGS budget account. So I broke the law and the federal employees. Use that number if you have to hire a helicopter. Use that number. <laughs> Do it. And they did it. And, uh, but I was banking on that Congress would bail the USGS out by having some supplemental funding. So, so it was okay. Uh, Bob, Cole. Yes. Uh, Bob, I, I can't imagine that you don't want to ask Bob Tilling about NASA's latest ideas on Yellowstone. Yeah, we're a cool Yellowstone magma sort of underground. Look at these photographs of all this water going into generating steam. Just how much heat is down there, how much water they're going to inject, where they're going to inject it, and how do they know where to inject it? Are you familiar with that? I, I read in the newspaper account this thing. <laughs> I, I blew me away. It's uh, very actually, I, I, I dug into it by checking with the TPL <laughs> website for stuff. And it just basically was some small group of people, but it's not officially stamped by NASA, that had this idea that somehow by you know, cooling off <laughs> Yellowstone, <laughs> they'll, they'll keep it from erupting. But anyway, that's uh, all we'll see. <laughs> yes? That does bring up a question. What is the source of the heat in in the planet, where did it come from? Is it just from bombardment and the creation, or is there periodic decay, or what is the source of heat, and what direction is it going? Okay, that's a great question. The, the question could was, you, what is could the you repeat the it? heat for the Earth? Eric, can you repeat the question? Yeah, he asked, what is the, the uh, energy source for the heat of the Earth? Is it from the time of creation, from all of the uh, falling together of the uh, cosmic pieces, that source of heat, which is the original primary heat, and or is it some other source? And and the answer is it's both. You, you, you have the primordial energy source, but you also have radioactive decay, or uranium, chlorine, and potassium in principle. And people have done studies on this on the thermal budget of the Earth, and uh, overall, the Earth is cooling down. Given a few billion years, it'll be a dead planet. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Including Yellowstone can also cool that. So, so if there are no more questions. Uh, well, Thank you very much. For your Thank you very much. Thank you very much.